When you have a new project going, what, what motivates you? you? You talked about getting people more aware. What, what gets you driving still? Um, I think it's a good question. I start always as a storyteller and a filmmaker with how I want the participant to feel. That is a driving force of what mm -hmm. I'm doing. And I'd say I'm a multidisciplinary filmmaker because I'm not faithful to like any specific discipline. So I look at the story, I look at the emotion, and then I move back from that premise. And then I go through a journey, and then that will take me to the technology. Mm -hmm. So with Riot, I wanted to reveal to people how you would respond in a riot situation. Right. And how you might respond is not how you think you would respond, but I may think I'm the person like, hey, let's take on the, the police, but maybe I'm really hiding behind the car petrified. So I wanted to really show people. So a technology that could reveal to you who you are was facial recognition and right. artificial intelligence. But using facial recognition is, is quite you know, unusual you know, in an artistic setting. So I mean, I, I'm guessing the, the technical feat, uh, what about you? Is, is it something that gets you driving when you, when you start a new project? Uh, the technology, I mean, to a degree, but I think um, high, high level, I mean, uh, the National Film Board, uh, ONF, uh, uh, as, as Karen said, generally it's story first. Um, generally. Point, generally, I mean, I think you, you, I would be lying if I said we never looked at a piece of technology and said, huh. what, what, what are its affordances? What do we think it, um, as, a, as a means of communication, as a, as a tool uh, for the artists that we work with, what, you know, what can it do? Uh, so we, we don't start there, but I would say that it, you know, we, we also um, don't ignore it. Um, but generally, it's sort of what is it we want to say about the world. A lot of what I do, a lot of what our studio does, is on the creative nonfiction side. Mm -hmm. So the focus there is on point of view storytelling. What do we want to say about the world, um, the artists that we're working with, the teams that are supporting them? Also, how do you get the audience involved? So it's about what you want to say, but it's, it's how you want the audience to perceive what you want to say. Does VR help? In, in, in getting the audience at the center of the storytelling? I mean, is that the, the main focus with that technology? It's not a, a, for sure that with VR or 360 storytelling that the, the, the person will be at the center. Um, some people say that when they put on a, you know, the very act of putting on a headset right. puts the user at the center, and I don't quite agree. I think that, uh, you know, you can, uh, you can, depending on how you design and the story you're telling, you can uh, put that user, um, uh, make them a ghost, make them uh, an observer. They can, they can be uh, just as distant uh, as you, you might be when you're watching a film. A film, yeah. So it depends. I mean, I think for me, Riot was an example where uh, There's no I'm very it. much There's at the center. Yeah. I'm very much at the center, even though I'm not wearing uh, um, a headset. There's no, uh, it's, it's not 360 or virtual reality, but it's very much the, the, the audience member is at the center. So I would, to answer your question, I would say not exclusively, no, because I don't use VR. Um, I create an experience where, as opposed to going into a world, the world is reflected around you. Mm -hmm. And I deliberately created that because through my experiences, your emotions will affect the narrative of the film. And I want to show the participants in the exact same way their emotions affect the narrative of their reality. So if you respond angrily to a riot cop, he will elicit a different response. And if you res he may elicit a different response if you're calm. And the same way that maybe if you go home and you have an argument with your partner or your flatmate, if you respond calm as opposed to angry, you may elicit a different response. So deliberately, I don't want to put you in this like consciously artificial state. Mm -hmm. I want to put you in a state to show you that there's no imperceptible technology. The webcam is monitoring you, but you haven't got any technology on you. So that when you walk away, you're like, oh, you, you're interacting with your life in the exact same way. So what's your philosophy about technology then behind it all? Mm -hmm. Do you feel that the machine mm -hmm. can help us know each other better? I, my objective with technology is to use it to um, help humanize us more, bring humanity back into our lives, as opposed to I find that technology often can isolate us and separate us from other people. Like if something's really dramatic happening on the underground, as opposed to helping people, people are quite commonly just videoing it. Mm -hmm. You know, our sense of humanity is slowly being eradicated with becoming this observer, because it's kind of like a separator of what's happening. I'm like, okay, let's use technology to evoke more of our humanity. So I'm kind of 
inverting the use of technology as an artist. Wow, so, so to bring out more humanity. Yeah, absolutely, and to give you a greater understanding of yourself and be a mirror back to yourself as opposed to somewhere to hide on your iPhone all the time. Does technology help your art make emotions come out even more? I mean, is that a way so for you to, to tap into that even, even better? Technology is the main communication tool through which people communicate. Mm -hmm. So if I'm an artist in this current age creating work, if I don't use technology, I am going to be isolating a huge aspect of my potential audience, particularly young people. If I go and paint and use sculpture, that's going to be a certain demographic. So it is the language that I... Is that, that something I, you think about? I'm 100% conscious of that as an artist. I'm 100% deliberate in every single thing I'm doing. If I want to reach people with a particular message, there's no point creating a sculpture if I want to reach 18 to 24 year olds. How are they going to connect? How will it resonate with them? Mm -hmm. So these are deliberate decisions I make in every single area of my craft. So that's the language I have to use in this current age. And um, I think the word you're looking for was, I use emotions to navigate mm -hmm. the experiences mm -hmm. so that it's like their emotions are the remote control. So subconsciously, you are navigating through this world and that you can go back into my experiences again and navigate through it in a different way and see how your emotions can elicit a different narrative. Mm -hmm. You know, every tool, every medium has its affordances. I mean, I do agree in the sense that um, uh, techno technology can, and, and specifically we're talking with Draw Me Close about mm -hmm. Uh, essentially what is a, a play, um, an immersive play, it's a one-on-one -on -one experience uh, between an audience member and an actor uh, that uses virtual reality technology. So the, the um, audience member is wearing uh, a virtual reality headset. Um, the artist at the core of it, Jordan Tannehill, very much uh, wanted to create something that uh, both said something about the world but that was also uh, emotional and had a dramatic, uh, a dramatic uh, arc to it. Um, so, it, you know, it, that particular medium, that those particular set of technologies has some affordances. I think one of them with VR uh, is its ability um, to, uh, to physicalize things, to, mm -hmm. to, to, to make you uh, recognize and remember that you have a body. Yeah. Um, and you can, per you can participate in an experience um, in that way. And in this case, it, it's something that uh, connects both an analog or a physical world and a virtual um, because it is a live performance, because it's uh, theater. Yeah, so uh, it's somewhat familiar for so the audience. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. Th that's the thing with technology and especially VR and AR, not, not everybody in the general public has had the chance to actually experience it. And so I'm wondering, in, in an era where uh, a lot of people have access to a lot of different types of technologies, is it hard as artists to leave a lasting impression, to impress the general public? Is it, is it getting harder than it used to be? I mean, I don't know. And when there were less technology around, uh, maybe people were more easily um, able to, to, to get into a story. Is it, do you feel that there's a change in how the audience uh, gets into a story or not? So there's always going to be a place for linear film and traditional sculpture and art, but how this technology affects us psychologically and neuro neurologically is completely different. There's been so much recent studies coming out, like young children as young as eight years old cannot decipher the difference between memory and VR experiences. Wow. So how that's affecting us is completely different to the emotional impact of like a painting or a sculpture. Um, so these are very, very, very powerful tools that we have at our disposal and that's why I'm seeing um, people I'm meeting around the world very, very impactful reactions to our work, which are very short. They may be like three, eight, nine minutes, but the emotion that you're eliciting is... Um, lasts. <laughs> lasts for a long time. Like I, I've done VR experiences or other media experiences for three minutes. I'm like, why am I crying after a three-minute animation? I'd normally have to be watched a 90-minute film to get to this sense right, of exactly. emotionality. So we're, we're, we've got a very, very serious toolkit at our disposal. Um, and the fact that it's in the hands of artists, I think, is a good thing because on the whole, most people I meet who are artists have a sense of um, vision and integrity in what they're doing. Mm. So it's a, it's a good time to be working with these type of tools, and I believe they're in the tools at the hands of the right people.